So hello, everyone, again. For those people who are listening to us from other rooms, you can still have you still have a chance to come here because and we actually need you here. So whoever is there, you can you can come in and we'll uh, talk about Kotlin. Yeah, feel free to join us because it's always better to see you in person, to see you in re your reaction and to see your, what do you actually think of what I'm talking today. And we also have this nice uh, sound of rain for us, which makes our talk probably a little bit cozy. So let's start. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains, and today I'm going to talk about Kotlin. You should be curious why at this point, because you probably already know that it's a programming language developed by JetBrains, developed also here in Munich. And uh, I hope you have already a chance to chat with Kotlin developers and our team zone. If not, find us. Uh, find Sebastian, uh, who is up there answering your questions, or find myself after the talk. What are we going to discuss today? First, we're going to talk about Kot the state of Kotlin in general, what we have today. And then I want to focus more about an important part for us, which is Kotlin multi-platform. And I want to end with what we might Anticipate in Kotlin 2.0 in the next version of Kotlin. So let's start. Kotlin is a modern and already mature programming language. It is interoperable with Java and other languages. It's concise, cross platform, and fun. And I wanted to ask you who, who are Kotlin developers here? Who wrote some Kotlin? Okay. Plenty of you, thank you, uh, who are Java developers here, who are Swift developers. Anyone? <laughs> OK, hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, so I hope that uh, you all find something interesting in this talk. Uh, so first, a bit of history. Kotlin's, we started Kotlin in 2011 as an alternative Java language, so to speak, a little bit better Java language. Then the uh, the next year, uh, in no, next year, in uh, 2016, the first stable version of Kotlin was released, and it became official on Android the year after that. And uh, this official announcement, this official acknowledgement of Android, gave us a boost of adoption. Like lots of people are now using Kotlin for Android. Among those of you who already use Kotlin. Who is it? Uh, who, who, who are from your mobile developers, Android developers? Not many. That's that's actually nice to hear to, to see. And who of those who use Kotlin already are server-side developers? Okay, probably around half. So we uh, we see that uh, Kotlin is um, yeah used uh, used both uh, for both these areas. So on Android, it became official and uh, it helped us to gain this adoption to, to gain this traction. And uh, the, the year after that, uh, the first stable version of Kotlin Coroutines was released, which is the Kotlin way to do asynchronous programming, which also introduced structured concurrency, which kind of shapes how we do asynchronous programming today, not only in Kotlin, but in other languages to some extent as well. And it's almost Kotlin 1.9.0 now. It will be released probably in a couple of days, hopefully next week. So we are on the border of this uh, new version. And an important questions about the Kotlin history, I would say the most important is like how the Kotlin logo was evolved. And first we have this nice cattle, and uh, then it changed quickly to some more Kotlin specific thing with K. And there is an interesting story with this cattle because I was also among the, um, among people who uh, were fans of uh, this first design. And there were concerns at the time, like, yeah, but it, this uh, colors look a bit of, uh, remind Chrome colors. And people might think that Kotlin is developed by Google. And we would like to avoid it. And where are we now with this? Yes, we, th thanks to acknowledgement of Android, we really have people who think that Kotlin is developed by Google, but we try to, to do something with it. Uh, also, by, by uh, having such events as well, by the way. 
So then uh, we have this nice keyboard, and then we um, again updated the logo uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, as you see, the design was becoming more modern and modern. And finally, after 12 years of uh, waiting, we have cotton mask mascot this year. So it just took us 12 years, and finally we have the mascot that you and uh, we can use for whatever references we need to draw with it and all this stuff. I don't know what it does say about the language. If you need to wait 12 years to get a mascot, probably nothing bad, but finally it's here with us. And it's called Cody, by the way. Kotlin. Concise, cross-platform, fun. And I want to try to explain what do we mean by this? What is the meaning of this, of this mantra? What do I stand by this? Let's start by fun, the most easiest thing probably. And the fun fact about Kotlin, you can both expect fun in Kotlin and have actual fun in Kotlin. And I promise, I'll explain what does it mean late in the talk, how you can have both at the same time. Another kind of fun fact about Kotlin, we have lots of attachment to the language. So it's like emotional attachment to the language from the community. It's a strange feeling, but often you read some news and someone says, like, yeah, the, the, the numbers, how happy people are from latest survey, but it's not only about the numbers, it's more like there are people who say, it clicked with me. I tried it, and after 10 years experience of experience of development, like development is fun again. Especially if you compare it with something that you used to have, all these modern development, modern languages, modern frameworks, they give you this drive to develop what is dead brains is about, what is cotton is about. They give you these um, emotions, uh, the, the things that, yes, I like to do this, I like to do this, I like my job. And that's 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 great, and we have lots of lots of feedback like this that it actually works for us this way. Okay, next part. Let's do some code, a little bit of code, especially for those who are not familiar with Kotlin. It's good to have some feeling of the language. Concise. What do we mean? What do we mean by being concise? We probably compare with some more old-fashioned reverse languages like Java here. And uh, so when someone asks me, it's like, okay, we have Kotlin, like Java has all these new versions, all these new features. Why do you need Kotlin if Java is evolving so much? But my answer is usually, but it's still Java. It's still that verbose language that we had like years ago. And it's, it's, it's not that they throw it away and write it from scratch, which you can do with another language like Kotlin. So it's, it's still... Um, it still doesn't solve all the, all the issues. And uh, we have this uh, also feedback about conciseness that people start using Kotlin, for instance, the Java developers, they start using Kotlin in their projects, and they, for instance, they have like a Java file, they convert it, and they say, yes, and now the result is much more concise, it's much shorter, it shrinks. So you had, I don't know, 100 lines of, okay, 1,000 lines, and then it's like, uh, 600 lines and it's like yes and like it, it these things matters matter and then uh, Kotlin has lots of features that allow us to accomplish it so it's it's not it's it's hard to pick one or two features here to demonstrate conciseness that's why I show you a bunch of them uh, for instance you 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 can define this uh, data class in one line and it uh, provides a bunch of auto generated methods for you and you have it uh, also getter and field hidden for jvm and it's uh, another fun fact i uh, remember the times when folks uh, told me that i like to use kotlin in slides because it's so concise i i I haven't yet convinced my management to switch to it, but I like that. Uh, uh, but I, I really appreciate this conciseness because it fits usually fits in one line or something, um, and it's uh, it, it really works this way. Oh, another small thing you you probably won't take it too serious uh, in as a one standalone feature, but it actually makes uh, makes the difference. You, in Kotlin, you, you can't declare a function at the top level, 
which also comparison to um, the cases when you, you you can only put in this inside a class that also makes a difference that also make makes our, uh, our code uh, more concise more structured and uh, more readable in better ways or you can have a single expression body which means that your function can just return something you can specify a type if needed and it's also a line, one line function which perfectly fits uh the case the very simple cases when you just return a value or return constant or return something simple and all these things they they matter you, you sum it up and you see that yes you have this concise language another example we have nullable types in kotlin which solves the problem of null pointer exception it's safety that kotlin brings um to developers that means that in this type you can store null reference and here in a list of nullable books, you can, in, inside this list, you can store null references. And it is, uh, it is defined in the type system. So type system guarantees that, uh, that something that you define as nullable can store null reference. And if you do not define it, you cannot store null references there. And Kotlin language provides uh, all the means to, to use it. And there are lots of, concise operations to work with, with these nullable types. So it's not only something that we have in the type system, but also we have lots of ways in a convenient, in a fun way to work with this, in a concise way to work with all these nullable types, like map with null operators on list or this state access operator that just returns you um, null if uh, the receiver is null. So lots, lots of these things that just, just uh, an example. Another example of being concise and idiomatic, it's not this one. This is, on the contrary, it's not concise, not idiomatic, because you have to repeat this data source several times. So it's like kind of some spring code, probably. You create the data source and you just set it up. You set up the variable. And in Kotlin, you can do better. You can just say, OK, apply all these properties on my receiver variable, on my data source. And the result is the same. And this one, in this case, you have to repeat all, uh, all this variable all the time. It's not a huge deal, but you, ha you still read it and it still bores and it's still not something that we can do in modern languages like Kotlin. And in Kotlin is in just this. Interestingly, this apply function, it's not a language construct. It's something, it's just a library that just uses functionality that in Kotlin, like language features in Kotlin, allow us to have it as a language construct, as a, as a, as a library function. It looks like cons uh, language construct, but actually it's just uh, a function and uh, different libraries, different frameworks can define their own functions similar to this. So in this regard, Kotlin is very powerful and expressive. Another example, you probably it, it, it probably is familiar uh, for many of you. In Kotlin, you can define an extension function on an existing class, which you later can, you can call as a member. And it doesn't break any encapsulation, so it, doesn't, it cannot access private fields or private methods of the class. But here, it lo and, uh, here you can, it's visible in completion, so you can find the necessary function uh, in the completion list and call it as a member function. And it works, um, it looks really simple, uh, this code. And uh, the, main, um, uh, the main idea why uh, it's so beneficial, it uh, gives us this ability to be interoperable with the existing ecosystem, with the existing frameworks. It, uh, one of the core characteristics of Kotlin is being interoperable with existing stuff, with existing languages, with existing frameworks. For instance, when we're talking about Java, let's say Spring framework, and you can write Kotlin code with Spring, with existing framework ecosystem, and they provide on top of what they have uh, in their Java API, they provide some Kotlin specific extensions which you, you can use to have your code look more Kotlin idiomatic. So this small feature, like, okay, you can just add an extension, it actually allows us to have interoperability to, 
to be able to reuse the whole bunch of existing frameworks, existing libraries, and use them in a better way from Cognate perspective, in a more idiomatic way. So this small, uh, small functionality gives us a lot of, lot of, lots of opportunities. And this whole idea of being interoperable with ex an existing ecosystem is, is crucial. It was crucial for, for Kotlin's success to some extent from the beginning, uh, from the fact why it became so successful in Android, why it became so successful in the Java community, because it always try, tried to be interoperable with the existing, existing ecosystem, existing solutions. So it's not that we rewrite everything for, uh, from scratch and say, forget what you knew by this uh, time. You just knew every. You just need to learn everything uh, afresh. No, we don't do this. We say, okay, build on the top of your existing experience. Build on the top of your existing expertise. And this interoperability with existing ecosystem and being able to improve the existing ecosystem is, from my mind, one of the things why Kotlin became so successful. Why we have it today as one of the most popular languages worldwide. And we'll see uh, here another example, because we use this approach when we try to do better Java language, but also we try to reuse the same approach when you're talking about Kotlin multi-platform and being able to interoperate with the existing ecosystem there. And we'll talk about it a bit later today. A couple of words about current users of Kotlin. Yeah, we have this misconception, thanks to Google acknowledging Kotlin, we had this boost of the language adoption. And also we had this, uh, this mis misconception appeared that Kotlin is mainly the language to developing mobile applications on Android, which is not true, of course. And uh, the numbers show us that two thirds of Kotlin developers are indeed Android mobile developers, but there is also a third and given uh, the large numbers of Kotlin developers, it's a lot, who use it for server side and for some other use cases like desktop development, uh, web development, and sometimes even Minecraft development. So like lots of, lots of stuff. On Android, it became official in 2017. Uh, two years later, it became Kotlin first. So Google announced that, okay, now it's not only officially acknowledged, but also it, it development is Kotlin first, and uh, development of new technology is Kotlin first. And they announced uh, their new modern UI toolkit for it, Compose, which is, which is written entirely in Kotlin, which, which is modern declarative framework. And uh, two years later, it became also um, stable um, on, uh, on Android. And this year, Kotlin Gradle, they say, this cell became default on Android. A couple of words about Jetpack Compose. So this is the code, the whole code you need to write in order to have this nice animation when you click on the image and uh, a title appears. So this, uh, this is a modern uh, UI framework written entirely in Kotlin. Everything is in code. You have the function, you have the composable functions and lots of stuff you can do really simple. And it's really kind of UI development becomes pleasure again, or not again, for, for some people it was, but to some extent it's, it's really fun to create these UI screens with Compose and that what, and uh, it's really fun to, to, to work with this framework, to work, to, to use these language opportunities, how, how it is implemented, how it's done. So for instance, here we have, like to do the animation, you just have this state property, whether it's expanded or not, when you click on the image, uh, you change the state, and you uh, use animated visibility to, to actually provide this animation based on the variable of the state. As you see, you, you, you can understand the code <laughs> probably right away, even without this experience with Compose. And uh, I highly recommend, even if you are not from UI development field, it's, it's, it's actually a fun exercise to, to play with it, to, to, to start using with it, to, to kind of to enlar enlarging your knowledge and enlarging your thinking. It's really fun to work with. So what's the current state of Kotlin on Android? Uh, if, we're to if we're looking at top 100 apps on Play Store, 95% of them will be using Kotlin, which is like, yeah, the, 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 there are some percentage uh, that use other technologies, but we see that uh, overall 
it's all about Kotlin. And now the compose number is also growing because it's a new framework, it takes time, but already 23% of, of, of the apps, they use, uh, they use uh, Kotlin. So that was about Android. Now let's talk about another huge area, which is server-side, Kotlin for server-side development. And we have lots of JVM frameworks who you can use with Kotlin and who, and they, most of them, they support Kotlin as first class citizen. So of course, Spring, uh, Micron and Quarkus also supports Kotlin and we also have our own development, uh, Kato framework, which is developed by JetBrains. So a couple of words about Spring. You can use, uh, for instance, when you start a new Spring project, you can use Spring initializer. You can you can choose Kotlin here directly to generate project in Kotlin, and then you it basically works. So you generate project and and you can use Spring with boot with Kotlin. Uh, it becomes even better with uh, with the uh, Kotlin extensions. It becomes more idiomatic, but basically it works, and you have all the framework that probably you're already familiar with with the nice language uh, in one. <coughs> in one bunch. And uh, Spring also provides documentation in Kotlin. So if you if you read uh, some Spring Boot documentation, you can pick either Java or Kotlin and to see how uh, something is done in a more Kotlin idiomatic way, probably. And again, there is lots of uh, extensions provided by different Spring functionality that makes it possible to use Spring in a more Kotlin idiomatic way. So it's all there, it all works. So you, you, you have all the benefits of the conciseness, of the expressiveness, uh, of the modern languages working with a very famous uh, spread framework. And it actually works with existing applications. So if you have existing Java application for Spring, you can gradually add Kotlin there. If you're interested in more advanced stuff around it, you can uh, watch this talk by Pasha. But he talks about some more advanced techniques for Spring developers, something like, when, especially when you move from Java to Kotlin, it's 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 a nice baseline to be aware of of some current cases and how how it all works. But in general, it works. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, the main thing. A couple of words about Kator. Uh, by the way, Kator is a framework that is developed inside JetBrains, and uh, Kator team lead uh, is based also in Munich. <clears throat> so there is uh, lots of interesting uh, stuff uh, going on there. So it's a very lightweight server-side framework. It's flexible and extensible. It's written entirely in Kotlin and is powered by Kotlin coroutines. So this is the framework where you have coroutines built in and everything uh, works on this modern synchronous solution. And yes, as, as I've told, it's developed by JetBrains and also it's developed in Munich. We have lots of successful stories about using Kotlin for server side. We have a specific page. I was I would say that this page is like if you need to convince someone that you want to develop, like let's switch to Kotlin. You can use uh, this page to see it's like, look, there are these big companies that already made this choice, and they are what and they share what they think about it, how they benefited from it. So we specifically gathered all these case studies in order to provide people some means to to persuade the colleagues, to persuade the management or whoever you need to persuade, um, to make, or to just analyze, to, to, to make the, cho the choice whether it's worth it for you to, to switch to it. That was about Kotlin for Education. And now I want to, oh, that was about for Kotlin for Service Side. And now I want to talk a little bit about education. Uh, three, 32 out of 100 top universities based on some rating, they teach Kotlin in their courses. That includes some well-known universities. And again, you can f f uh, find this data. It's, it's, it's very good for us because uh, this Kotlin adoption actually starts at universities. Because people, usually people, when they try Kotlin, it's hard for them to move back, at least to move back to Java. It's probably different for other modern languages, but if you started to use a modern language, it's, it's, it's a bit hard to, it might be a bit hard to kind of stop having all these uh, nice features uh, available and your yeah, tool chain. So it's like, it's really great that uh, we have uh, all this uh, in education. And it actually includes two. I don't know how many of you actually, no, not, not me, how many of you graduated from TUM in this room? 
someone amazing yeah thank you so it's like it's your it's your place you know and now to my actual provides a coding course and the uh, has some internships for Tum students and actually three people from Tum are currently working on Kotlin in the Kotlin team so it's also kind of uh, an opportunity and we have these close connections with them one more thing i wanted to to share the, which might be useful for for you if you just learn kotlin decide to learn kotlin or if you want to learn a new library or investigate a new library or if you want to share something from your library from your model with your colleagues which is called the notebooks and uh, pe many people know REPL concept when you have this loop of try to of, of something that uh, uh, some environment where you can try new things, where you can uh, show, write short snippets and so on, so forth. And we believe that notebooks might be this better replacement for this uh, concept. Kotlin has a REPL, but it's not probably that great as you would like to. And notebooks are a concept well known by data science community, and they are used routinely by data scientists and we say they are underrated by regular application developers probably because there is no good tooling for it and with the latest releases we, we try to fix it and we try to have this better tooling for this so the core thing is you can say okay you can create your notebook and then you can say okay let this notebook use my uh, my files from my projects and then you can create some document notebook that combines markdown and samples which are automatically executed and run by this uh this notebook it immediately shows you the results and the most important thing here or one of the most important things here is that you can then store it and share it with your colleagues so you can store such things in probably version controls or you can just share it just like look that's uh, I, I created this new api that's how we expect you to use it and everyone can run it and can see the results and because it comes from data sites there are lots of data visualiz vis visualization libraries available for you to actually show the results uh or analyze data so it's like it's very powerful con uh, concept and we gradually introducing it to, uh, to to application developers and we hope that uh, it will be a useful tool for everyone to learn language to learn new libraries to experiment with it and share the results of the experiments next promise part big part is Kotlin multi-platform what is it? What's it the, what is it about? We already know that you can use Kotlin on many different targets and many different use cases for many different applications like server, Android, mobile, web, desktop. And the most important thing is that you can also share some parts between, this, between these use cases. So you can not only use that for one of the use cases, but you can share some, some Kotlin code between, for instance, server and clients, for instance, like network data um, and stuff, and some utility functions. And you also can share some code between mobile clients. It, it, um, the, this, uh, the, the use cases I've covered so far, like server and Android, they are Kotlin for JVM. So it was constrained by, and it used a Java virtual machine, and it was mostly about Kotlin for JVM. But now we are talking about stepping outside of this JVM constraint and using Kotlin compiler to compile to have native binaries and combining two so it's like using Kotlin to uh, you can use Kotlin to have some JVM code code that runs on JVM and some native code that runs for instance on iOS devices or Kotlin can be compiled this is experimental to WebAssembly to run to run this in the browser or to Kotlin JavaScript to run this browser and this is something is like step, something new, stepping outside of JVM, it's, uh, and uh, being able to share this uh, the uh, this code between different use cases. And I want to dig deeper a little bit into how how it all works and what it is possible for it. But the main thing, yes, we we are we're talking not only about JVM, but we are talking about different targets, web target, native targets like iOS target, and. Uh, uh, and other targets. <clears throat> and Kotlin approach 
is unique in this sense. Comparing to other cross-platform solutions, they say, yes, you can share this code between different platforms. You can use cross-platform solution, run this code to own different to mobile uh, um, systems. Kotlin doesn't say that you need to throw away everything you, ha you already have. You don't need to start from scratch. And it doesn't say use, uh, use this only solution uh, and um, build, every, uh, build everything fresh. It tries to combine these two ideas. So instead of having cross platform development versus native development, which is our regular, our usual choice, it's like you should either go all in cross platform or stay native. And there are benefits of cross platform development, like you have single source of truth, fewer bugs, consistent logic, and so on. And there are benefits, but there are also benefits of native development because you have the, ex the access to all the native functionality, power of native platforms, and so on. So usually all these frameworks that try to you to go all in cross platform, they lose this native uh, native benefits. And in Kotlin way, we try to combine both and say, okay, now you can have cross platform and native. You can stay native being cross platform at the same time. This approach is really flexible and it's unique. And I wanted to explain now how it works. So basically, uh, the, uh, the best scenario for this explanation would be mobile scenario, mobile case, when we have uh, Android and iOS target, but it actually works for, for more targets in this case. It's more straightforward what, what, what we're doing, it is easier to explain. So here we have cross-platform part that is shared between Android native part and iOS part. And this part can be compiled both to JVM and to native. It, compile, it is compiled to GVM to be used on Android, and it is compiled to native uh, binaries to be used from iOS. So the same part is used by both frameworks, and it doesn't mean that you, ha you have to write everything here with this new framework. You can integrate, uh, using this approach, you can integrate uh, some common, some shared logic into your existing applications. And that's what differs it from, from other solutions. And the data shows us that. So we ask our Kotlin multi-platform users, which parts do they share, which parts they want to share. And they say it's like um, serialization, for instance, data, data classes and serialization, networking, some utilities, algorithms, data storage. So it's like, they just decide to share only parts of the application. For instance, only data classes, only networks. So they don't need to share everything. They can pick the small part to be shared. How does, how does this work? Uh, you, uh, your shared part is neither JVM nor native because it's like uh, your shared part cannot use all the JVM ecosystem because it also should be compiled to native binaries. And that's why it only can use the, uh, the common multi-platform libraries. And there are already plenty of them. It's like two years ago when we talked about it, we were like, yes, there are a couple of libraries by, by JetBrains, and we hope the community to build on and to create more and more multi-platform libraries. And now we can just say there are plenty of the libraries the community created. And uh, Google also started to convert their, their, some of their libraries to multi-platform and uh, uh, provide them as multi-platform libraries. If you're interested, this is the best way to check, uh, the best link to check the available multi-platform libraries. Mm, it's a site, it's a page gathered by one of my colleagues <clears throat> who just uh, listed uh, currently available multi-platform libraries. There's still, we're still kind of not there in terms of full coverage and people Complain, sometimes complain that they miss some of, especially Google uh, libraries, they want them to be multi-platform, but like it's going and currently you can uh, find an alternative if you, need, um, if you need it. And if you haven't found the alternative, how does it work? You still have the opportunity to tweak your code a little bit uh, and to provide different functionality available for each of your platforms. And one of the easiest way to do it is to use interfaces, simple interfaces to provide different implementations for different platforms. So for instance, if we have two targets, Android and iOS, and we wanna 
provide some functionality that like common part of functionality that um, mostly behaves the same, but we have something that is different. For instance, something that accesses the native um, capabilities, the, uh, the native <coughs> uh, interfaces and so on. You can define an interface, for instance, you can define an interface and implement it differently into Android and uh, iOS. In Android, it just, it just uh, works as uh, simple as expected. You, you have this interface and uh, you can use this Android dependencies and uh, write whatever you want. Very straightforward. But what about iOS? In iOS, you can also implement this interface in Kotlin. So this is Kotlin code, but this Kotlin code uses iOS uh, dependencies. It, uh, this Kotlin code is using uh, API that is provided us by Apple. That's it. So from Kotlin, you can write the code that accesses some native uh, functionality and uh, otherwise behaves differently. So if you implement something and you find, okay, I need to access some native uh, parts for some time, you have this option. You have this, uh, you have this capability. And this is this approach that you have some cross-platform parts and some native parts, again, is what differs Kotlin from other uh, similar cross-platform solutions. Or oh, for other cross-platform solutions that, solve this, that try to solve the same thing. And uh, remember, I promised you that I'll show you expect fun and actual fun later in the talk. So that's, that's the time, that's the place. In order to use these interfaces differently from Android and ES, you can you can use dependency injection, for instance, or you can say I, I have this expect function platform that returns me this uh, interface, and you provide different actual fun actual fun implementations on different platforms, which returns you the specific classes, and that's it. And the compiler, when it comp when the compiler compiles code, it says it sees okay, I call this platform function, but it is an expect function, and it substitutes the 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 call, the invocation of this function, when it compiles to Android with this implementation and when it compiles to iOS with this implementation. So compiler automatically resolves everything and will, when you write code, it even says you, oh, you have this expect function, but it is missing in one of the targets, please implement it, stuff like this. So it's like you also have ID support. But again, the crucial part here is like how this approach is different and how we expect this this uh, this this idea of yes we want to be interoperable with the existing ecosystem uh, to um, to bring a kind of success to, uh, to to let Kotlin succeed in this regard in uh, being this uh, language not only for for Android but for Android and iOS. So again, this is the whole picture. You have the shared part, which is cross-platform parts written in Kotlin when you, you can use multi-platform libraries and tune different parts using these native APIs. And then you have Android native part written in Kotlin that uses it as a regular library. And we have iOS native part probably nowadays written in Swift, which uses it as a framework. So you just provide your common code and uh, your iOS part just depends on this common code. That's it, that's the approach. And talking more about interoperability in general and this, uh, desire to be interoperable with the existing ecosystem we have we need to be interoperable with swift that's that's uh, there is no question here because when you have this shared part which is written in kotlin and you need to call it from swift and you need to use swift pay there is this boundary this uh, there is this interoperability currently it works through objective c bridge it works it uh, it uh, gives some constraints so it's like it's not ideal we want we want to do better in the future but it works and later we'll be working on providing the direct uh, interoperability so this technology is in beta now and it's going to be stable later this year and we hope the community <laughs> will use it more and more um, because it's cool. And we already have a bunch of successful stories, got the multi-platform stories. Again, if you need to convince someone, if you could need to convince yourself, you can check this page and see how people share, how they use this technology already, for what cases, what do they share, why they decided it, and how satisfied they are. There are lots of lots of these stories from, from the communities. 
And uh, this illustrates this approach that it is very flexible. So you can decide to only share a part of the logic in your shared part, or you can decide everything and keep the UI native. Or until uh, until um, for, like starting recently, you can also share UI. So this approach is probably not for everyone, but it already works. And if you are ready to sacrifice native UI experience or you, uh, you need something to develop really fast, you want this shared code basis for everything, uh, you just want your application to start and running tomorrow, ideally, or yesterday, then this might be a solution for you. And probably it, uh, it, it will be good enough for your application. You won't even need to trade. This is Campus Multiplatform. And this is a modern UI framework from JetBrains which works for multiple platforms and which is based on Google Jetpack and Pose. So we basically get, uh, get this uh, Compose, uh, Jetpack and Pose from Google and we try to expand it to more platforms. We, we expand the same logic, the same functionality to more platforms, to iOS, to uh, web and to desktop. Currently the desktop is stable. Android just works through a Jetpack and Pose iOS is in alpha, so it's like it's still uh, in active development. And the web part is uh, experimental because it's, uh, it's based on WebAssembly, which is itself kind of, uh, it uses some experimental stuff in WebAssembly, so it's like, it's more experimental. But <laughs> kind of our future is this. We want to, someday we'll have all the platforms stable and you can just use them. And uh, Compose as a framework is just a modern UI framework. And if you compare it with other frameworks from other domains like React, you have lots of similarities. So there is an article, how to convert your vocabulary if you know React, how to quickly start with Compose, for instance. Like, it's just a modern way of doing uh, UI development. It's somewhat similar to SwiftUI. Of course, you have some differences, like here is a function, here is a class, but in general, it's, it's also similar. Everything is code. Uh, you uh, you have these live previews. Um, you you can extract everything like in functions. You have you can reuse, and it as I told you, it's like it it just becoming fun again. Just building the UI now is a very pleasurable experience. And for instance, the same example that I showed you earlier, that is Jetpack composed from Google. We can run it uh, now on iOS and desktop, and it works. We just replaced painter resource. Yes, there are some uh, discrepancies because, for instance, resources are handled differently on different platforms. So you you have to do to use something new for it, and not all all the libraries uh, <clears throat> get multi-platform. But in general, it just works. So everything like UI related just is just the same, and it already works. You can already play with it, start with it. It's like it works on uh, iOS uh, in this case simula simulator, and it works on desktop. And the general idea, uh, what I want to share here is like, now it's really enjoyable to create UIs with all these modern frameworks. Either it's Compose Multiplatform or it's Swift UI with Kotlin Multiplatform and Shared Logic. It's just still, it's just how we uh, currently do things, how we, uh, it's, it's like a modern way to do things, a modern way to create UI. And this is really a pleasure. And uh, in the future, when we have the full support for hopefully for web and for desktop, it also gives us a lot of opportunities to create the same, try the same code that works on both platform and probably share something with mobile. So it's like, that's, that's probably not of, it's like we already have something, somewhat of it today, but it's more about what we have tomorrow or the next year, but uh, it's already. Uh, we unfortunately don't have a lot of time, so I will uh, briefly show you about 2.0 and we'll, um, we'll finish. So I just wanted to, to share that uh, what, what, the, like we have this uh, Kotlin 2.0, the next version of Kotlin, planned oh, next year, I suppose, I would say. And we've been writing the compiler for several years now, and it is called K2 Compiler. And now it will be released as Kotlin 2.0 release. Uh, it is, um, this new architecture is faster, so it's like you, you have, you'll have the performance uh, improvements and more extensible, so it's like it makes it easier to implement new features. If you are interested in technical details, you can 
uh, find these uh, videos on YouTube when we uh, it's like I create a video of explaining this uh, t technical side of what what does it mean that we're creating a new compiler and there was some uh, talk from my colleagues and uh, it will come after 1.9 sometime next year so the next major version would be 2.0 after 1.9 point, uh, point something and feature from feature priority it will be basically the same at Kotlin 1.9, so it's like we want to introduce new features immediately. We just want to ease this process of migration to the second, uh, the next version of the compiler, so it won't be splitted like we have, uh, I don't know, Kotlin 1 and Kotlin 2. No, it will be uh, smooth migration, and we encourage everyone who are using Kotlin now to try this 2.0 version on your projects and report if something doesn't work, because this is the act of development and we are looking for it. And if you're interested, you can check the talk by Roman, the keynote of this Kotlin Conf, if you haven't seen it, when he uh, also mentions anticipated new features in Kotlin 32. And uh, here I want to also mention our Kotlin YouTube channel. If you're interested in more details, you can find lots of videos and information there. And we are done. <laughs> Finally, now, because I think that everyone's like, you are two minutes late, two minutes late. Uh, so have a nice Kotlin. Thank you. Don't forget to use mascot. And thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you.